All right, everybody get your seat. Get your seat, get your seat. Oh, yeah, the joys. The joys of youth conference. Well, okay, you having a good time, right? All right. Hey, you ready for the last day? <laughs> All right. This is the last day, right? All right, everybody quiet down, please. Yo. Quiet down, guys. Any guys moving around, whatever? I'll sit you to the back if you can't be still, okay? I don't mind doing that. Hey, I was a youth pastor for uh, 17 years, and uh, I loved it, loved it. Hey, hey, you quit moving chairs around. Settle down. I know, you, I know you're awesome because I didn't talk to you, but if you don't settle down and chill, you'll sit in the back by yourself, okay? All right, so my name is Pastor Rod. As I said before, uh, I, I, hey, I, I love youth conference. I love middle schoolers. I love, um, that, that was my favorite group when I was a youth pastor. Uh, I, I have, um, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a pastor at a, a, down, a church in Alabama, in Huntsville, Alabama, and it's called Movement Church. I've had a lot of fun in my life. I've, I've traveled around the world. A lot of times I've, I've done some crazy things, been in a lot of different countries and uh, doing mission work. When I was a kid, uh, I felt God put his, I, I felt God tell me, I was going to do something great in my life. And this older lady, and I found out later she was a really famous old prophetess. Now, do you know what I mean when I say prophetess? Okay, she's a, like a prophet, but a lady. So they call her prophetess. So she was a lady who, would, who, would, who God would tell things that were happening in the future. Re really crazy things. So she put her hand on my head. I was 10 years old. And she said, you, she goes, I called you. She said, thus saith the Lord. So when somebody says that, that's like God talking. So I'm like, um, oh, God's talking to me right now. Because it, this lady seemed really old to me. She probably wasn't but about 70 years old or 75. But, but I, mean, she, I mean, she lived for another 20 years. But this lady said, God says to you, I've called you long ago. And I'm like... I'm only 10 years old. How could God have called me so long ago? And I'm like, so it was a little bit freaky, but she said, I'm going to use you to travel around the world and I'm going to touch your life. At 10 years old, what do you think about that? You know, it kind of blows you away a little bit. But here's what I started doing. I started hanging out with missionaries. I started hanging out with wild, crazy people who had done cool stuff for God. And uh, can I just tell you some of those things? Okay. Um, let's see. This session is about finding your purpose. Okay. What's up, my brother? <laughs> this session is about finding your purpose. Okay. And how many of you, how many of you guys love to have fun? All right. You, you, do you love to have fun? No. What, what do you, but what do you call fun? Do you call fun sitting for hours and hours and hours playing video games? Is that fun? Because, I mean, there is fun in that. I mean, my son, my son is a little bit di addicted right now to uh, Blocks Fruit. And that's just, you know, this is one of his games. But to me, now, of course, as a grown-up, fun is different now than it used to be. Okay? But I love having fun. What, what, do, you, what do you call fun? Like going outside. Exploring. Yeah. Going outside what? Exploring. Exploring. How many like to explore? I, I, grew up, uh, I grew up on the river. I grew up living next to a huge river, way out in the woods. Hunting was a big deal for me. I love to hunt. I love to, uh, I was I telling some of my, uh, some brothers back there in the back, I was talking to Zach about uh, buying, uh, getting my son uh, his first pellet gun and uh, my son Walker. I have, 11, I have an 11 year old son, if you can believe that. I waited, y'all, I waited a long time to get married because I was having so much fun traveling around the world and preaching the gospel. I ran from the law preaching the gospel. Okay, are you ready for this? I ran from the law in the, in the, in the country of Nepal, where Mount Everest is. I tracked up and down those mountains with a team. I was taking the gospel of the book of Mark to people who had never seen white people and who'd never even heard about Jesus. I could have got six years in jail for what I was doing. And uh, I knew it was against the law. And I never will forget when they, when the, the, the police caught up to me and they made, they stripped, they made me strip down 
because they were trying to find something about Jesus written, a, a, piece, of, a piece of Christian literature written. They were trying to find it on my body because they knew they had been, we were, we were tracking about 25 miles a day. And they knew I had, they, they knew all these villages where we were going were getting gospel material. They didn't know how they were getting it, but they knew somebody was passing it out. And when they found me, they took me in an in interrogation room and they made me strip down and they were trying to find this gospel material. And I know, I, I was so, believe me, I was so thankful that the day before, just the day before, I had given it all out. And my team, we had given it all out. And I knew they weren't going to find any, so I, knew, I said, just praying, God, you got to help me. So from there, I went to the airport. And I had been up a lot the night before because I was sick. My stomach was, a, somebody had put poison in the food, and I, I, I didn't know, because I, I'm one of those kind of people that can eat anything. I, I really have, I have eaten, I have eaten, I don't want to gross anybody out, but I've eaten a lot of stuff on the mission field. I started going in the mission field early, at an early age, and uh, I've eaten a lot. Spam. Huh? You ate spam? Spam? No, no, no. But I have eaten half-developed chickens in eggs where they, you can open them up and see the eyes and see the uh, beak and see all this kind of stuff. It's called balut, and it's in, in the Philippines. And it, well, you know, it's a delicacy of the Philippines. It's a real famous dish, but I've eaten a lot of cool stuff because if you're at a table and you're, if you're at a table with a bunch of people, excuse me, and you're going to tell them about Jesus and they're eating, they're all eating this food and they're offering it to you. What are you going to do? I mean, you have to eat it because you're getting ready to tell them about Jesus. But if you don't even like their food, do you think they're going to listen to you tell about Jesus? No, they're not. They're just not. Okay. So, but I wasn't afraid anyway, because I love trying new things. But back to Nepal, I was sick all night. I felt like a steel ball with spikes was rolling around in my stomach. And I was praying to God, God, heal me, please. I'm hurting so bad. I was, it was a dirt airport in a little town. If you ever Google it sometime, it's called Joomla. Now it's a bigger town, but it was little back then. This was 1987. So I was crawling on my hands and knees at this dirt airport and I was saying, God, please help me. Please help me. I feel like I'm going to die. Would you please help me? I mean, my stomach, I felt like a knife was in my stomach uh, cutting it. And I was, and I was, I was a tough guy. You know, I, I, I could handle a lot of things, but this was hurting so bad. And I said, God, would you please help me? Okay. So imagine this. I got a couple of guys that speak English, English on my team. I'm in a little town and all around me, as far as you can see, are the Himalaya mountains. As far as you can see. And all of a sudden, from one of the side of the mountains, comes walking this white dude. He comes walking right up. Out of his hand, there's 12 pill, pink pills. And he said, and they were Pepto-Bismol. You might know what that is? It's the, you know, the stomach medicine, you know, pills. He said, he looked at me, handed me the pack of pills, spoke perfect English. He said, hey man, it looks like you need these. I said, oh, f -f 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 I mean, y'all, I was, I was dying. I, I, was, I felt like I was dying. I grabbed those pills. I said, th thank you, sir. He said, you're welcome. Turn right around, walk down, back down the side of the mountain. Now, you know what I did. I opened up that blister pack of those 12 Pepto-Bismol pills and chewed them all up and swallowed them. Okay, now, then, then in about five minutes, y'all, it was coming back up. It was like a, it was like a big blob of nastiness in a, in a plastic bag in, inside. No, I'm just telling you, I know somebody, I know, I know somebody had put poison in there uh, or, or some, kind of, some kind of bacterial stuff to hurt us. So I said to the little Indian, to the Indian chief of the town when we were getting on the small one engine plane to fly back to Kathmandu, I said to him, Tell that, white, tell that white man, tell that American, thank you for bringing that medicine. And he said, there, there's no white people here. There's no one who speaks English here. No one lives here like that. And he said, who are you talking about? I said, it was a man. He came walking up the side of the mountain and handed me medicine. He said, no, sir, no one is here like that. We know everyone. So I know God sent an angel. I know I got to see one of my angels that take care of me. And he came walking up that mountain and handed me that medication. Can I, can I tell you another story? 
about like that. Okay, so I was in Kathmandu in the city. Uh, this was four or five days later. And uh, have you ever seen one of those cool, uh, uh, you probably, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're, they're a, it's called a Gurkha knife. It's a huge Nepalese, it's like a little sword knife. And it's about that long, got a bone handle. The, the blade is super strong. It's not, it's not thin. It is, a, I mean, you can go through the woods and hack stuff. And, and I mean, you're, I mean it's, it's, it's awesome. So I was buying one. And this one was really beautiful. It had a beautiful case. And it was market. It was in the market downtown in Kathmandu. And everybody goes there on Sunday to buy stuff. And they got vegetables and all that stuff. But they also have some cool handmade, uh, handmade swords. So I've got this. Uh, so I am... Um, looking at this sword and the guy wants $40 for it. Well, $40 is like a whole year's salary in, in Kathmandu back in 1987. And I'm like, 40 bucks is all I got. And I don't really want to spend all the money I have on this sword, on this, on this, you know, sword knife. And the guy beside him holds up a really cool one and with a black leather case. And it's just like the one I want. He says, I sell you $8. I, s I sell you for $8. I said, $8? That's way better than $40. I said, yeah, that's what I want. And I take out my money and start to pay him. And I realized, and I didn't know this at the time, I realized I just insulted this guy. Now, the, the knife he's trying to sell me that's in a turquoise and brass case, it's all gorgeous. It looks like something that ought to be in a museum. But I didn't want that. I wanted something a little more cool, something that, you know, I could, that looks more real. But I didn't know that after, after you've been talking with a guy that wants to sell you something and negotiating, and I keep trying to get him 20, 20, sell me 20 for 20, give him $20. No, no, 40, 40, 40. I only sell for 40. Was, I mean, I couldn't get him to come down. So I'm like, I'm not giving you all my money. So when this guy said $8, I'm like, um, that's what I want to pay. Yeah. So I go, yeah, $8. So when I go to hand him my money, the dude at the other table, jumps over the table and starts. I didn't even know he knew this much English. He was cursing me in my language. You mother, jumped up, started swinging, pulled that blade out of that case and started swinging at me just like this, side coming at me. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking my mama's baby is gonna die. <laughs> Okay, you gotta understand, I was scared. Now, has anybody ever watched the movie like Indiana Jones? Okay, well listen, a whole group of people gathered, a big circle of people gathered around us, and I'm backing up, and this guy's coming toward me like this, who, I kill you, I kill you, and I, I just didn't know that I had insulted him. I, you, you, can be how, you can see how surprised I was. I didn't even know I had done what I'd done. Next thing I know, I'm backing up. I'm saying, God, you got to help me. God, I didn't think I was going out like this. God, you got to help me. You got to help me. And I'm backing up. And as I'm backing up, hold, holding my hands out like this, I feel something pressed in my hands. And I, you know how you do when you, something presses in your hands, you just naturally grab it. I grabbed it, and it was another blade, another sword just like his. They were wanting me to fight. And I looked in my hand, and I went, no, no, I don't want to fight. I'm a missionary. I, I want to tell people about Jesus. I'm here, to I'm here to get people saved. I don't want to kill nobody. And I'm like, ah, but this guy's going to kill me. What am I going to do? And this guy's coming closer and closer, swinging. I kill you. And I mean, everybody's gathered around. It's probably, imagine like I'm in the middle of this room and there's people gathered around on the outside of this room screaming. Rah, 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 rah. And I'm like, it's like Indiana Jones movie. I'm going to die. I'm going to see Jesus today. It's over. And all of a sudden, from behind me, I hear this, these words. Hey, what's up, everybody? And I turn around. And there's this guy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. There's this guy with his peace signs up in the air. Long braids down both sides like, a, like an Indian, but he's not. He's an American. He looks like a hippie, like some hippie from back in the 60s. He goes, hey, what's up, everybody? I went, what? What the, what? I look, he goes, hey, he goes, he walks up right beside me. Come here. 
He walks up right beside me. He throws his hand around my shoulder. He goes, this is my friend. I ain't never seen him before. He goes, this is my friend. He's an American. I went, <laughs> everybody stopped. Everybody's frozen. Everybody's staring at him. He says, thank you. He says, he says, he uses rupees. Now you got to understand rupees is like saying dollars in America. Rupees is their money. He uses rupees for toilet paper. Now, he just insulted them, but they don't speak English. So they don't know. And I couldn't speak enough Nepalese to translate, and I wasn't going to tell them he just insulted them. Anyway, he uses rupees for toilet paper. Well, another thing, if they did understand, they don't have toilet paper there. They don't even use it. They use their hand. Now, listen, listen, I, I, I'm just going to tell you something real quick. In case you don't know, did you know over a, over a third of the world's population uses their hand? Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, before you think that's nasty, listen, before you think it's bad, I'm going to just tell you the truth. You ready? Are you ready? You ready? There's a water spigot or a water pitcher right beside where they use the bathroom and they wash their hand. They, use, they, they, cl they clean their rear end. They wash it again. They clean and they wash their hand really good. Okay, now, that's actually more clean than what we do. According to the medical, medical science profession. Now, watch. So he said, he used his rupees. Remember the guy, the hippie, just walked up beside me, put his hand around my shoulder. He used his rupees for toilet paper. And then he goes, yay, y'all take it easy, man. Everybody be cool. And he walked away just like that. And I went, everybody forgot about the knives. Everybody forgot about what was happening. And I thought, I've just seen an angel or God has just sent a crazy hippie to rescue my whole life. So, you, you know, so at a young age, I begin to see God doing miracles. Sometimes, you know, I don't like being afraid. I, I don't like being scared. But sometimes I know that when I'm the most afraid, God's going to help me. You know, and, and so I got around crazy people who would trust God no matter what. And I went to this missionary training school and I said, I, I want y'all to help me, help me travel around the world and preach the gospel and do all this crazy stuff. And you might have heard me tell this story, but I was going to my missionary training camp and I hitchhiked. Now, you can't do this anymore on an interstate. But I had my thumb out. I had 500 miles to go. I mean, excuse me, I had 500 miles to hitchhike. I had been hitchhiking all day. I had about 80 miles left and I was out in the woods. I mean, I was out, I mean, on a highway in Virginia and woods were on both sides. And I here's what I said. I said, God, I believe you. That the I was screaming. Now, I don't know if you've ever spent a night in the woods beside a major highway by yourself with nobody, but I had. And it was scary. And I was 19. And I didn't ever want to do it again. And I said, God, now how many know if you've ever been scared and desperate and, you, and it's a past memory and you don't ever want to do it again, how many know that's going to make you pray harder? Six people. Okay, all right. So, no, I'm just kidding. And more than that. I will just tell you one more time. The way you find your purpose is you get around people who are doing what they were called to do and are loving it and are happy. If you want to write that down, do it. This is how I find my purpose. I get around people. Turn around, please. I get around people. Thank, thank you. I get around people who are doing what God called them to do. Don't get around people who are bored all the time and hang out for days with them. Why? Because you'll be bored just like them. Get around people who are loving life, doing something fun, Find a good leader. Find somebody who you know loves God and loves having a good time. So I was at this missionary training camp. I hitchhiked there. And how many miles did I have left to go? 
80 miles. Now, and, and how many know what I did not want to do that night? I didn't want, want to sleep in the woods, in the forest. I did not want to. So, and there's forest all around me. So I prayed. I cried out to God. God! I'm on the highway. Highway 85 in Virginia. God! I believe you! I'm screaming on the highway. I'm screaming. Y'all, I'm wide, screaming wide open. God, I believe you that the next car that comes down this road, the next car is going to pick me up and take me all the way to the missionary camp where I'm being trained to be a missionary. That's what I said. I, I said, I mean, I got real bold. Why? Because, y'all, I'd been praying all day, and I'd had about 15 different people pick me up, hitchhiking, and drop me off, pick me up, drop me off on the highway as they were getting off their exit. They'd, you know, they'd leave me, of course, and I would stick my thumb out and get another ride. Now, I, please, 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 don't go home and say, Pastor Rod said I could hitchhike and obey God. Do what God wants me to do. Don't, do, don't tell your mom and daddy that. They'll, they'll freak out. What kind of conference are you going to? You know what I'm saying? But people did this back in those days. Okay, back in the day, they did this. If they were desperate and needed to get somewhere. Have you ever seen anybody with it doing like this on the side of the road? Okay, so you know, it's, it's usually, well, it's, sometimes it's usually an older person. So are you ready? Are you ready? I turn around. I just prayed and asked God, God, I believe you the next car that comes down this road is going to pick me up and take me all the way to where I'm staying at that missionary camp, all the way to my door. Stuck my thumb out. Way down the road, about a mile, I saw it. Heard it. Sw swerving on both sides of the road. It was one of those huge old Pontiacs. I mean, one of the, it looked like a land yacht. I mean, it was huge. It came right, the guy was drunk, swerving all over the road. He, I went to stick my thumb out and I thought, hey, I don't want to ride with him. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to die. Who want, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but my mom taught me better than to get in the car with a drunk person driving. Come on, right, right? right. But what had I just prayed and asked God? Next car. Everybody say next car. Next car. Now. I wanted to say this, God, did I say the next car? I meant the next after this one. <laughs> I, but hey, I'd already have prayed and asked God, God, the next car. And I was bold. And I put my thumb out anyway. The guy pulled to the side of the road, right, he would have ran over me. I had to, now you know those silver guardrails that are on the side of the highway? I had to throw my, my uh, I had a military, uh, big military duffel bag, because my dad's a Vietnam veteran, he's awesome, my dad's an awesome warrior, and, and uh, I threw my duffel bag over the guardrail, jumped over the guardrail, and he, he came right where I was standing. I looked in this car, and the guy was, y'all, I'm not talking about a little bit drunk. He was, he went, get on in. When he said that, I, y'all, I'm like, oh. I grabbed my bag. Go in the car. No, I grabbed my bag. I put my hand on the back door because I'm, I'm going to open it, throw my luggage back there and, and get in the front beside him. I open, I go to open the back door and I say, I give, give God a minute. I give God just about five seconds to speak to me. Why? Because when you get into something that might be, a, that might, that might be dangerous, you need to know, you need to get a, give, get, give God a chance to tell you yes or no. Guess what God told me? Nothing. <laughs> he didn't say nothing. I said, God, put my hand on the door. I didn't hear nothing. And I knew if God didn't want me in that car, he would have said no. So I didn't hear nothing. So I said, I'm getting in. Opened the car, threw my, threw my a duffel bag back there, jumped in the front seat. That guy stomped on the gas pedal and started driving 80 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour. Now, the speed limit was only 55 then. S swerving all over the road. I look, there's an empty bottle of whiskey on the floor. Beside him, there's a full bottle. Oh, no, not beside him. Right next to it is a full bottle that hasn't been opened. And beside his seat where he's driving is a half a bottle that's been half drunk. So this guy's toasted. He's driving down the road. 
I smell, I mean, you can smell, I don't know if you've smelled alcohol before. I hope you don't ever have to smell it. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> you can smell it really bad. Okay. All in the car. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And this guy's swerving. Now I've never been in the car with anybody who was drunk or drinking. My mom taught me better than that. My parents taught me better. So I wasn't going to get in the car with him, but I felt like since I prayed for the next car, I was in it. So here I was, he was swerving all over the road. I was getting scared. Guess what I did? I started praying in tongues real low under my breath. Like, God, help me. You got to help me. I might die. This is, this might be the day I die. You know, because the Bible says that when you pray in the spirit, you're speaking mysteries to God and he knows what you're, what you're feeling, even when you don't know how to say it. Okay. So I'm, I'm praying. And I, and I hear so, okay, how many know when you pray in the Spirit, how many have ever heard this? When you pray in the Spirit, sometimes you'll get, sometimes the Holy Spirit will give you an interpretation. Okay, that's in the Bible. Okay, it's in 1 Corinthians. So I get, all of a sudden, I get this thing coming up in me. You need to tell him whatever he's going through. You need to tell him whatever he's going through that God cares about him and you want to pray for him. I said, okay. So I reach over. I said, hey, sir. Touch him on the shoulder. I didn't want to distract him too much because he was already drunk. And I didn't know if it would cause a wreck or whatever. But I knew something had to change because I might die. I said, sir, I don't know what, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I'd like to pray for you if you'd let me. That guy looked over at me and says, you don't know what I'm going through right now. My sister, 42 years old, died of a heart attack last week. And I'm going to her funeral. And I, I could feel, and he, he started crying. He was, and he was drunk anyway, so he started crying. And he was just, he was just falling apart. And I said, you know, and I, I could feel the grief. I could feel the sorrow in his voice. And I thought, well, you know, I've, I've prayed for people before. I thought, in my mind, I thought, I've prayed for people before that are going through death. That's not, a, that's not that big of a deal. I, I mean, God can do this. God can help him. So I, I, I reach over, touch him again. I said, sir, if you'll let me pray for you, I believe God will take that hurt and that pain out of you. And then he screamed at me. He looked at me and he says, you don't know what I'm going through. Two weeks ago, I was at work. I'm a school teacher. I was at work and my wife and two children were at home and a tornado came through my town in Asheville, North Carolina and killed my wife and two children and I don't have anything else to live for. Y'all, I was from, I was living in Virginia at that camp, I, but I was from North Carolina and I knew that tornado had come through Asheville. I knew what he was talking about and I knew the people that had been killed. I, I'd heard about that report on the news. And when he said that, he started crying and I could hear the, the pain and the bitterness. He had nothing else to live for. That's why he didn't care if he died. He, he was drinking. He didn't, he didn't care. He didn't, he was probably to the point, he, he probably didn't want to hurt other people, but he probably just didn't care. And y'all, I felt God's, I felt in my heart, I felt, God, I really need to pray for this person. I really need to. Now, I wasn't as concerned about the car and driving as I was him hurting and wanting to die. This time, for real, I reached over, touched him on the shoulder, put my hand on his shoulder. I said, sir, if you will pull over and let me pray for you, God is going to help you right now. Guess what the guy did? I couldn't believe it. The guy pulled over on the side of the highway. He pulled over and he looked at me. Y'all, y'all, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not really much of a preacher at that time. I don't know a whole lot about God, but I just know God wants to help people who are hurting. So I reached over, put my hand, excuse me, put my hand real hard on his shoulder. And I said, pray this after me. You know where I'm going, right? I said, pray this prayer after me. I said, dear Jesus. He goes, dear Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Change my life. Change my life. Take away my pain. Take away my pain. I said, take away my hurt. Take away my hurt. 
He's repeating after me. He's very obedient. And I said, give me a brand new life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And I ask you to come into my life. I led him in a prayer. He prayed. And man, he didn't get. I said, thank you. He goes, thank you, Jesus. And he opened the door of the car. Well, right before he opened the door of the car, I looked over. All of a sudden, his face totally changed. All of a sudden, his eyes are big and bright. His smile is big. And he gets, he, he, he turns the car off, opens the door, gets out of the car, and starts walking down the highway going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, it really happened. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because you know how you're, you're heard like, you hear these church stories and you're like going, oh yeah, it happens to everybody else, but it never really happened to me. I mean, oh God, wouldn't it be awesome if it happened to me? This guy's walking down the highway. Finally, he comes back. He gets in the car. He, he says, oh, you don't know how I'm feeling right now. I said, yes, I do. He goes, no, you don't. I went, okay, I don't. You know what I mean? For real. I'm like, he goes, God has took this hurt and pain that was in me. It's gone. And I looked at him. And, and snot is pouring down out of his nose. Tears are rolling down his eyes. This guy, is, he's crying, he's, but he's happy at the same time. He, puts, he starts, starts the car, puts it in drive. We start driving 55 miles an hour. And I didn't say anything about it. 55 miles an hour. And he's totally not drunk. I've never seen this totally stone cold sober. I looked at him and I thought, you got to be kidding me. I've never heard about this in my life. I've heard about it once or twice, but I've never seen it happen. This guy is driving down the road and we're driving down the road we're about 10 minutes. And I'm sitting here going and he says, oh, I feel so good. Thank you, Jesus. And all of a sudden, swerves the car to the side of the road, slams on the brakes, stop, puts it in park, turns it off opens the door, gets out of the car again, starts walking down the highway. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for this joy that I feel. I'm not going to die. I love you, God. Thank you. This guy is having a worship service on Highway 80, Interstate 85. Y'all, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder if we need to find a, like a pond or something so I can baptize him or maybe pray and for him to get his prayer language and get filled with the Holy Ghost. Listen, this guy got in the car, started again. I said, I, he said, man, you don't know how I feel. I said, yes, I do. I know. He goes, no, you don't. I went, okay, I don't. He's so excited. He's so fired up because he was in the depths of despair. He was drunk and trying to use alcohol to make him feel better about his life that he had nothing else to live for. And Jesus came and saved him. And that's the reason God had me there. That's the reason I prayed that bold prayer. God, the next car that comes down this road, let him pick me up. Was it scary? Yes. Listen, listen. If you're going to go where your purpose is supposed to be, don't miss this. You might want to write it down. And Pastor Ben says, note takers are history makers. Listen. Sometimes when you follow God's plan for your life, it's scary. It's scary. Not all the time, but sometimes it's scary when you follow God's plan for your life. I had a lot of friends in high school. How many of my friends do you think followed me to missionary training school? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Nobody did. Why? It wasn't cool. It wasn't cool. But guess what? Nobody had stories. Nobody had stories like God. nobody had adventures like I had. My daddy was a Green Beret and a ranger, jumped out of airplanes, highly decorated. He's 85 years old. And he's a, he's a, my daddy was a, is a warrior. And I wanted to be an adventurer like my dad. I wanted to do great things, but, I, didn't, but I, I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. Listen, I'm gonna say it one more time. Sometimes to fulfill your purpose, you gotta do stuff that's scary. You're gonna be scared. Maybe nobody else is doing it. Have a seat, please. Maybe nobody else is doing it. Maybe nobody else is. Maybe it's not the cool thing to do. Maybe somebody doesn't have a shirt like you. 
Thank you. That guy, that drunk guy, he said, maybe somebody didn't have a shirt like me. <laughs> My daughter bought me this for Father's Day the other day. Thank you. Hey, so that guy, that drunk guy, the, oh, excuse me, the guy that used to be drunk and is now sober, stopped three more times to pull on the side of the road to walk down the highway to thank God for setting him free. Now watch this. He pulled into a, this was a long time ago, so Kentucky Fried Chicken was a real, real popular place back then. He pulled into a Kentucky Fried Chicken, went inside and bought me this huge chicken dinner. I was starving. And then he said, I want you to give me directions right to your door so I can drop you off at your door because you have been an angel in my life today. Y'all, you, you better know I was freaking out. You better know that I was, I was like, I can't even believe this has happened to me. Wait till I tell my friends. I mean, nobody had cell phones back then, you know, except, except huge construction. Where, and they were a big briefcase, you know, a f phone was only held in a big briefcase. But y'all, I, I know this is crazy. And I know it's kind of hard to believe, but God has done big things and crazy things in my life. Have you guys ever, I mean, y'all know, y'all know some of my past. Okay. A little bit, maybe. Have you ever heard of uh, Family Feud? You ever heard of Steve Harvey? Yeah. Okay, you ever heard of that, that guy that screamed naked grandma? Yeah. That's me. Okay, you know, that's me. I, I'm that guy. If you ever pull up YouTube and you look up naked grandma, I'm the guy that pulls up there. Okay, because I was with Steve Harvey. He's a good friend of mine. And, and uh, I've been on that show seven times and with my family. Okay, listen, 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 listen. No, 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 I'm not famous. I, I don't see that. Thank you. But I don't see that as I don't see that as famous. Listen, I see that hitchhiking story as famous because God saved that man's life. I see family feud, me screaming naked grandma. I see that as I'm crazy. Do you want me to tell you a little bit about that? Do you, is it all right? Is it all right? OK, so my my wife fills out this application. She goes to familyfeud.com and she fills out this application for us to get on Family Feud. And we were on there, we're praying for the TV crew. God has really opened because of cool doors. We, I lived in Florida then, and we, we went to Universal. That's where they're filming it. And we get on there, and Steve Harvey gets me up there, and he says, well, right before that, they ask a question to our whole family. And the question is, anybody pull it up yet? Is it legit? Am I legit? Oh, yeah, You're, it's right. It's true. It's true. I mean, it's had... I don't know, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred million hits on all the different websites of every kind of thing. Y'all, I've been on Nike. I've been on Good Morning America. I've been Jimmy Fallon. I've done all the matter of fact, when Steve Harvey was interviewed recently uh, on nighttime television, one of those TV shows at night, they said, hey, tell us, tell us one of the craziest moments that ever happened on Family Feud. Guess what he says? This country dude gets on there and we ask, what would a burglar not want to see when he breaks into a house. You know what I'm saying, right? You know it's true. Now, you got to understand, y'all, I'm at a pastor's conference two years before. Have you ever heard of that country? Um, you know, I didn't make you scared, did I? I know. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. So, ever heard of that country, uh, country comedian, Jeff Foxworthy? He's the guy that tells all those jokes like, you might be a redneck if. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all don't know him up here? Okay, he's famous down there, okay? He says stuff like, you might be a redneck if you cut the grass in your yard and you find a car. In other words, you, you wait so long to cut the grass, it's this high you can't even see. Or he says stuff that's a little bit weird like, you might be a redneck if you go to a family reunion to try to get a date. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Okay, so, all right. But he is a Christian guy. So watch this, watch this. We're at a pastor's conference, and he says, are you ready? Are you ready? You're going to want to hear this. He says, I'm, I'm eight years old. I get up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom. And when I open the door to the bathroom, the last thing that I expect to see is my grandma naked. No, no, for real, for real. So watch this, watch this. Yeah, yeah, I, I did, I really did. Okay, but watch, 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 watch. So he opens the door. He said, seeing his grandma naked was like seeing a basset hound. 
You know, the, all, the, all the hanging skin on that dog, the basset hound. Okay, watch this. So, he tells this joke, not joke, he tells this story to all of us preachers. There's 12,000 preachers there. It's a big conference. So, I hear this story, we're laughing our butts off. It's awesome. So watch this. When Steve Harvey says to me, what would a burglar not want to see when he breaks into the house? What do you think my mind pulled up? Naked grandma. My, my, <laughs> Y'all, my mind pulled up Jeff Foxworthy opening the door, not wanting to see something, and his grandma naked. So what did I scream? The first thing that came to my mind, y'all, that, that night I laid in the bed in Florida where I live laughing my butt off because I didn't even process what I was saying. He said, what is a burglar? Now I want to see when he breaks into a house. I screamed. I hit the buzzer fast as I could. And I said, naked grandma. <laughs> now listen, you got to understand. When I said that, Steve Harvey went, huh? And threw down the card. Uh, the question that threw down the car and he goes, naked, huh? I mean, Steve Harvey goes, naked, huh? Okay, by the way, Steve Harvey flew me, flew me back to Chicago to be on his show. You can find it on uh, uh, Steve Harvey show, All Stars. Don't, don't look down. It's, it's, it actually, I was on a show with a bunch of more famous YouTube people. And the reason he got me on the show, he wanted to find out why I said that. So I told him the same story that I just told y'all about why I said it. But watch this. I can't tell you how many people have gotten saved because of that story. There, no, for real. There, I'm, not, I'm not going, I'm not saying, naked grandma, I love you, Jesus. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. But they heard who I was as a pastor, came to my church because they said, the naked grandma guy, he pastors that church. Now listen, all I ever wanted to do was do something great for God. And if I go down as the naked grandma man, you know I'm going you know to be like, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go, God, come on. Come on. Could, could you not have done something better? But y'all. Naked grandma. Show it to Okay. Okay. Yeah. So y'all listen. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. Listen. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Don't think putting God first in your life and serving God is a boring life. Because I could, I could stay here with you right here in this room if they brought us food, of course. I could stay here and tell you story after story after story of my life of wild stuff. God's, let, let, listen, God's let me be a part of. But better than that, my wife... My wife is awesome. My, my two daughters and my son are awesome. I've been so blessed. Listen, if you want to find your purpose, listen, listen, find out. Find, find out how much God loves you, okay? What time is it? All right, would you bow your heads? Everybody bow your heads. Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. All right, everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. Nobody looking around. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name, or I ask for this group that's in here right now, that everybody that's heard these stories that I share today, Lord, I ask you, help them to find people who are fired up about you. Help them to find people who love life and want to have fun and want to do it for God. God, don't let them get stuck in bore, around boring people for days and months and years. Let them find people who love Jesus. Or they like to do fun stuff and are exciting. And not, not that we run away from boring people all the time. We don't do that because we've got to learn and we've got to study and we've got to do things. But Father, help them to find their purpose and find fun, exciting people in love with Jesus. Who they can connect with and who they can experience the awesome life you died to give us. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen.